Welcome today to A Rumor It Happened. I'm Eric Rush, and I will be sitting for my first time in the host chair today, and I am joined by a whole group of people, and I'm excited to get the gang back together today. And we will be discussing today room number five, and this, and this room is something that is very interesting to us. This is Parkland Hospital Trauma Room Number One, and the date is November 22nd, 1963. And so I'm joined today by a number of hosts. I'm welcoming back Don. Don, would you like to say hello? I'd like to say hello. Hello. <laughs> and Chris. Hi. And Alexis. Hello. And Robert. Hello. So we have a big panel today to discuss this very interesting topic of, of the Parkland Hospital Trauma Room in uh, on November 22nd, 1963. So as everybody who listens to this knows, November 22nd, 1963 is a, a momentous date. I think we all remember that this is the date that President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. And we'll be discussing that uh, in, in some detail, but we're also going to be discussing this from the context of that room. So the room where it happened, we really want to know what happens in the room itself. And some, some things we know because they're a matter of public record and some things we have to guess about uh, because they are not a matter of public record. And we're going to be doing a lot of both tonight, uh, uh, speculation and reviewing of the facts. And as it is the Kennedy assassination, there is always plenty of speculation and some conspiracy theories there too. Uh, I don't know how, how well we're going to go into the conspiracy theories, but we are certainly going to talk a lot about this topic. So who would like to discuss a little bit about the, the timeline of events that happened in Dallas, Texas on November 22nd? Anybody want to take, take some of that timeline here? I'll take the first edge of it and try not. It's one of those things you can get as detailed or as you want to or be as loose about it as you can. Um, first of all, it's important to understand this is a year before the presidential elections. So part of the timeline, the big picture timeline is Kennedy is coming to Texas, but this is on the leading edge of what will be the reelection campaign in 64 and trying to solidify, you know, the situation with Democrats in the South and Democrats in the South right there at that time are not necessarily a unified monolithic group of folks. And so there, there's more to be done there inside of his own party, probably than you would normally find in most of today's politics. Uh, but the visit that day had started with uh, the, the actually, I guess, the day before he had been in Austin, the night before he had been in Fort Worth, have stayed mm -hmm. in that hotel there in Fort Worth, uh, in downtown Fort Worth. And then uh, as ironic as this sound, they flew over from Fort Worth to Dallas. Sure did. <laughs> that short little, that doesn't short little trip. doesn't make sense. Yeah, that short okay. little trip. And so he lands at Love Field and then there's the parade through downtown, Love Field being just north of downtown in Dallas even today. And then swinging back around to what would be northwest of downtown, for those of you who know the Dallas area, which is towards where the trademark is. Up, uh, if you know modern Dallas today, uh, you still pass by this going up one of the branches of Interstate 35 as you head up through there. Um, where the actual assassination occurs, which happens uh, about 1230-ish, roughly, I think 1237, one of the dates that I saw, uh, times that I saw in one of the timeline, is really as the motorcade is really leaving downtown, Daly Plaza, as we know it today so well, was not the highlight of this parade. It was the what you were passing through the last two turns you had to make before you hopped on the freeway and headed to the trademark. So about 1237 that day, uh, the events of Daly Plaza, I know we'll talk about those. And then obviously once the president is shot, um, a very quick trip. It's really not that far up what would have been the, the, the expressway at the time, the Stimmons Expressway. You see it there on the sign. Uh, if you're familiar with the signs there, it's, uh, it's six, seven minutes probably at most to Parkland, which was, I guess, the probably the premier hospital in Dallas at the time, one of the larger hospitals. Certainly was a university-related mm -hmm. hospital, so it had all the benefits going with that. It would have been the designated hospital for trauma, and it was also the close place to go. So it made perfect sense. The arrival there, 1257 is the time that I normally see for the pronouncement of death, roughly speaking, an announcement shortly after one o'clock. And uh, so the events of November 22, uh, the, the eventful events of November 22 are compacted in probably 30 to 45 minutes in terms of what happens with the president's life. So that's the short version. Anybody wants to expand it out from there, certainly ought to. Well, and that's and that's great, Don, and and I appreciate the your your Texas knowledge uh, um, about that. Just knowing a little bit about the geography, and so it, it's it appeared that 
within about five minutes of the shots being fired, uh, five to six minutes, because the motorcade was traveling at, at, at an estimated 80 miles an hour. I mean, they were wanting to get there really fast, of course. And within five or six minutes, they were at the, the doors of the emergency room in, at Parkland Hospital. And so as you might expect, they immediately took him from the, 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 the car into the trauma room. And what we're looking at, the all the all of the hosts are looking at is a, is a picture that Don found of the trauma room as it existed, at least so far as we know, as it existed in 1963. And what's interesting to me is that it is not all that different from what a trauma room looks like today. Uh, there's no computers there, of course. Uh, you know, there's there's not as many gadgets. Some of the some of the equipment is just it looks just a little bit older. But the overall layout of the trauma room is, is not all that dissimilar to what it would look like today. And it, and I have to say, you know, before, before we go further, you know, I don't want to pretend that I'm any sort of expert in, in trauma. Um, I, I am probably the, the opposite of whatever, whatever you would consider a trauma surgeon. I, I am the opposite of that. So I'm a, I'm a geneticist and we are the doctors that you should trust least with knives. And, but, you know, we all have the, some of those experiences when we're, when we're in our training. So it's a very, uh, so it really is very similar to the way things would be oriented today. And so he would have been brought in immediately and they would have done a very quick assessment and they would have been, been looking for, and we, we, look, we just do this very easily. It's, it's ABCs, airway, breathing, and circulation. So they'll be looking to see, does he have an airway that is, uh, that is stable? And the answer to that was no, um, he didn't have a stable airway because he had a wound that had extended from his, from above his right shoulder blade out through his trachea. And so there was a big wound there. And so the first thing that was done when he was assessed was to, was to put in a tracheostomy. And the, that is uh, something that could have been done today, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but certainly that's something they would have done. And then they would have assisted him um, with, with, a, with breathing and circulation. And they did this with, with chest compressions. And so the fact that they did chest compressions the entire time that he was in, in the, the hospital or in this trauma room before he was pronounced dead suggested that his circulation probably never returned in any meaningful way, which essentially means President Kennedy was dead when he arrived at the hospital. Because he's the president, you know, heroic measures were taken. Heroic measures should have been taken. That was, that was entirely appropriate. Uh, but his condition was at that point moribund. I mean, he, we knew that he was not going to survive at that point. And that, that, that whole process listed, lasted approximately, as far as we can tell, about 25 minutes based on the, the timeline that Don uh, had mentioned. And he was pronounced dead uh, right around 1 p.m. Central Time that day. So I think where the, the room where it happened and the thing that, I, that, that was fascinating to me was not necessarily the, 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 the medical aspects of this. Obviously, they're still fascinating to me, the medical aspects. It's what the Constitution had, had not said about what we do next. What, what, is the, what is the next steps here? How do we approach this when we have a period of time when there is no president of the United States, at least not officially? And so... Let's talk about that. Well, and 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 uh, I'll step back after mentioning this. That matters more now because, again, Kennedy. We talked. This has been a topic of discussion on the fork in time you know, with a series of, of things. There, we're in the nuclear age. He's a nuclear president, and so minutes now potentially do matter far more so than they ever did with uh, other presidents who were assassinated. Uh, you know. McKinley, <laughs> Lincoln, <laughs> you know, minutes matter. So I, I, that, that's part, I know what your context is by asking the question, Eric. Well, right. and w- what I find interesting, and this is to that context, one of Johnson, they took Johnson was in the, they took Johnson to the hospital too. And he stuck off in another room in the ER and they're just kind of looking him over, to make sure nothing's wrong with him in well, the midst of all this. And, and Robert, it was even more than that. It was, it wasn't just checking him over. They were definitely doing that. Johnson right. had had chest pain. Oh, yeah. did not he know had, that. He had chest pain and he was actually taken to be evaluated. And if memory serves, he had actually had a, a heart attack not that long before that. that. That is correct. I do know he had heart issues prior to becoming president. But part of, back to Don's point, after they came in to him and one of the Secret Service comes in and goes, Mr. President, and he kind of gives them this look and, oh, he didn't know. He didn't know. Um, but but his whole thing was at that point, get me out of here, get me to Air Force One and do it as clandestinely as possible. 
because I've got to make sure this isn't some kind of thing right? with the Soviets or anybody else. Because he, he needs to get the Air Force One and he needs to get back to Washington. Yep. And getting communication. That right. I'm a little struck by. It seems like this is almost a watershed uh-huh. in presidential health crises, thinking about what had happened with Lincoln. And okay. we mentioned this a little bit. Lincoln survived to the next day. And his vice president was also targeted as part of a thing. So Lincoln survived, you know, there, there was a little bit of a time frame there between where we may not have had a president. There was mm-hmm. also after the Garfield assassination, we can talk about that. He held on for an extended period of time. Uh, McKinley, I don't know how long. I mean, when I say Garfield, I mean like weeks he was holding on. Oh, it was um, it was a long time. That, yeah. That, that he, yeah. With with, with uh, McKinley, it, I want to say it was a couple of days. You have what happens to Kennedy. After Kennedy, you have the attempt on Reagan where we're in the CNN era. Five minutes after people find out that something happened to Reagan, we want to know who's in charge. And Al Hay thinks it's him. Um, and then also to throw back to another um, room where, it ha- or yeah, room where it happened, we did uh, two ago was the uh, elementary school on 9-11. Yep. As soon as we yep. realize something's happening, we need to get the president in communication with everyone so we know it's him. Right. So well, and it was the same real... thing. Bush right. was like, get me back to Washington. You have Johnson saying, get me back to Washington. Right. right. Yep. So, so it, it's really interesting. This is kind of the first time that that happens where we've had a presidential health crisis and we need to get somebody in charge. It had happened before, and it had always kind of been, you know, we had talked earlier also um, about Edith Wilson and Woodrow Wilson. That had also kind of not really been addressed. So this was the first time that it really was, you know what, clock's ticking. We need to have an answer. We need to have an answer right now. And we, and we can't go any amount of time without a president. And so even, even before he took the oath of office, uh, you know, some minutes later, you know, Johnson was was already referred to as 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 you know, Mr. President and asked for instructions. You know, what do we what do we do now? Uh, and but there was some delay in before the public knew. Right. It wasn't much of a delay, but but it was it was a little bit of a delay. Well, e- even those instructions are interesting. I think we probably all heard the story of, OK, they get on the they, on the communications gear to to D.C. to find out what the instructions are. You're talking to the attorney general of the United States. Yes, about you are. what the process is well the attorney general also just happens to be the the brother the younger brother of the now recently deceased president and again I, i've heard so many times the the awkwardness of so many, the awkward awkward is a common word that's used that day and over that week in a lot of instances uh, but the awkwardness of uh, needing robert kennedy to be the one who would say what's the oath how do we do this can, for example can it be any judge does it have to be a particular judge you know they end up they end up bringing in i guess the federal judge there in uh in the in the dallas district to be the one that does that you know, there's a question of can it be you know can it be the justice of the peace or does it have to be a federal judge does it have to be a supreme court judge i mean just little things like that Although, to, to Robert's point, they're already calling him Mr. President. That's a formality at this point in terms of the <laughs> actual practice of things, uh, but still an important formality because in, something needs to be evidenced for the world that there's continuity of power. Would he be automatically considered the acting president, though, as, um, is, uh, with, a, with the death of a president? I don't think prior to the 25th Amendment and that actually being defined the way that it was through the amendment and then through later law that flows out of that. I think there were there probably still are points of ambiguity around that even today, no doubt. But definitely then, for example, if this had been a something, there was a a response needed for a missile strike or calling bombers or something like that of the day while he's there still being checked out for the heart condition there at Parkland and he did. Could he have issued an order? Would it have been followed? Right. I don't know. I mean, well, you know you where wonder. I'm going to go in my head because it's me. I'm thinking monarchy. You know, there there is no break. Yeah. You know, it, there's that whole thing with George VI, Elizabeth II. We don't necessarily know when Elizabeth II became, quote, queen, because it's like as soon as her dad died, she was queen. There was no, no break. There's always... I was wondering, we don't have that because we have an elected 
official. So it's 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 a whole formality thing. Okay. Absolutely. Well, it, it's a formality, but I, I think it was in Lincoln's case, it was, if I remember correctly, Secretary of State Stanton had kind of taken, not Stanton. Seward. Seward, was Seward thank you. I was trying to think of which one it was. It was the guy that bought Alaska. He kind yeah. of took over at that point and issued, it, it, he had very much a uh, Al Haig moment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> o- o- only only no cnn cameras in the- yeah, no CNN to, <laughs> without, yeah without the cnn cameras of that. but yeah i think he but he he was pretty much taken over at that point but it but you know if i remember correctly they actually raised the alert level up a notch the minute it happened too yeah. you know that the military actually went to a higher state of readiness Tell, tell me a little more about that, Robert, because that, that was something I, I actually wasn't aware of that. Yeah, That's if, if I remember correctly, if I remember from what I read correctly, that they actually took us from, if, our, if five is the lowest, they took us up one to four. Okay. Just to make sure. Everybody's you know, ready in case, yeah. in case somebody takes advantage. In some yeah. case, yeah. And, and I think it was, you know, A, is there something going on? But B, is there something going, is there somebody going to just take advantage because remember, the Cuban Missile Crisis is pretty much a, only a year away from this. Right at this point, you no, know, we had the Bay of, Bay of Pigs in 1961, 62. You have the Cuban Missile Crisis, and now you've got the president gets shot. <laughs> you know, middle of the Cold War. That's not a fun time. Perfect tie-in, Robert. Thank you for that ability that that ability to plug the the Bay of Pigs of uh, Fork and Time. <laughs> That Chris and I just did a couple of weeks ago. So if you haven't if you haven't checked it out, please check it out. It was a really fun one. I think Chris and I really enjoyed recording it. I did have a question for you, Eric, that does relate back to uh, to the trauma room itself. Right. Um, I know that you know, emergency medicine was not your thing, but you obviously went through the typical rotations that that all medically trained personnel do. Um, what do you think it would have been? Lo- I mean, they they had to have known before the limousine arrived. Uh, that the president was coming. They knew the president was going to be there. They had a, it was fast, but there was enough time to know that. Is your brain thinking at all as, as particularly as an emergency room physician there about who it is? Are you really that focused on your job and your training? And you mentioned this, and I think this may have been off podcast. You're probably dealing here with a fair number of residents. You're dealing, you know, this, the nature of the hospital is you're not dealing, there are, there are experienced trauma professionals in the room, not to say that there are not, but you have a mixture of experience that there, what, what is that like? Can you relate to that from your experience at all? Absolutely. You know, I think with, with, with medicine, a lot has to do with the time um, of, of what's, of what's going on. So if you're, your your people who are generally sort of lowest on the totem pole are the most likely to be there overnight. And so when I was a, when I was a medical student, when I was a resident, you know, I was there alone, and and the attending physicians were generally at home sleeping. Um, now that I'm the attending physician, I'm at home sleeping. Um, but but it's but that's if you're overnight, that's what you're seeing. But when you're looking at this, if when it's it's twelve thirty p.m. and it's a weekday, everybody's there. And so what you're likely to have, if you know that the, that the president's there, you're likely to have a lot of the more senior folks there that are kind of be, you know, going to be kind of in charge. And, as, and as, as I recall, one of the people who was there initially was the chief of surgery, who was a vascular surgeon by training. And, and for a president being you know, in town and potentially needing medical care, that's not unusual at all to have, have kind of your, what you would consider to be your, your top or most senior folks there that are running the show. Now you still have a variety of levels of people there. So you're going to have, you're going to have your, your more senior faculty physicians, you're going to have more junior faculty physicians. And then you're also going to have, at this point, you will have fellows, residents, medical students. Now at that point, the medical training was a little bit different, but you're still going to generally have medical students and residents. And so it's a, it's going to be a lot of people. And one of the struggles, one of the things that's difficult in a situation like this is not is not having enough people in the room. It's having too many people in the room, because you need people to work, or you need space to work, and you need some people to get out of the way in order to do that. And so, a lot of the the methods by which we do that developed subsequently to to this, not necessarily because of the Kennedy assassination, but but just because medical science marches forward, 
is how do we do things like this? How do we do resuscitations in a way that's consistent? How do we do trauma assess assessments in a way that, that, are, that, that is consistent? And a lot of that did develop really over the kind of the later 1960s and 1970s. Um, so that's good to, good to keep in mind when you're, you're thinking about this. And so what, what I picture in my mind is are, are people bringing Kennedy in and this, this mass of white coats behind this group of people that's starting to descend on the president to start working on him and, and people trying to keep them back basically to make sure that they have enough space to work. That's what I see. And in those days, everybody was wearing their whites. Um, we don't do that anymore. I, this is what I wore to work today. Um, so we don't, we don't, you know, we don't wear their, our medical whites very, very frequently anymore. So that's, that's kind of what I think about when I think about the, you know, likely what the scene is going to be. And we're, and we're going to have the picture. The picture will be on, on the webpage of nothing else and, uh, you know, other ways that link will link to it out of the show notes. So if you're, cause I think it is valuable. See, the other thing that struck me when I found the picture, it seems small compared to what we think of as being larger spaces today they're a little more open maybe a little bit more fluid for what you're talking about the ability to to move around easily not to be you know running into things is is that just my impression or or, or is that something that jumps out at you as well when you think when you see here versus maybe what you would see today yeah it's it is a little small uh for uh, for what a, what a trauma bay would be it looks pretty kind of similar look um to to what a trauma bay would look like but that, that's one of the things that you that you think about when you know when when you're just looking at older medical facilities, older medical rooms, as they tend to be smaller than what they are today. Um, the, I think I mentioned to you, Don, when I when we did the vaccine episode, the, the polio vaccine episode, that you know when I was a when I was a, a very junior faculty member, my office was in the old University of Nebraska polio ward. And so it was this, it was this really long, skinny, almost claustrophobic room um, because that's what junior faculty get for offices. Um, and, but, it, but it, it, it was very different from what either a medical room would look like or a trauma bay would look like. And, and Chris, cor or correct me if I'm, or Eric, I'm sorry, correct me if I'm wrong, but when they came in outside of doing chest compressions, that's pretty much all they had done or were doing because Back then in 1963, the ambulance practition was scoop and scoot. They basically brought, there was none of this EMT yeah. working on him and he's hooked up already and all that when he gets in, correct? Certainly there, that, that is a, a, a much more professional status now. You know, there, there is a lot more training that, and expertise that goes, goes to, uh, to the, the EMT role than what existed at that point. But it's also a, you know, kind of a, uh, an issue of medical futility, you know, so you're, so you have this, this, this person who comes in, they're not breathing. So you're trying to get an airway in. So you've got the, you've got this tracheostomy in and they, we, we are presuming that the president is in asystole, meaning his heart's just not being at all. Um, and so you, yeah, so sure, certainly do chest compressions, you know, people talk about, you know, you, you're, you talk about getting the defibrillator units out and, and zapping a person, but you don't do that in asystole. And, and so you, you have some medications that he could have been given. Some of those medications were available in 1963. Some of them were not. And so there's a, so it's just a very, a very different set of circumstances, uh, that, that were present there. And at some point you just, and, you know, we've all been in this role at some point you call it. At some point, you say this is not this is not working. This is not going to work. This patient is dead, and you call it. And and if you if you ask me, you know, do you actually call out, say time of death, and then announce the date or announce the time? Yeah, you do that. That's a real thing. Um, but uh, and so, so presumably somebody who whoever was leading the trauma team, and you know, very likely it was this it was this chair of surgery. Who was leading the trauma team eventually said, "All right, we're done. We're done here," and and you know called the time of death. And and based on what I what I read in Kennedy's autopsy report, it looks like it was it was right at one p.m. So you know all all of this that we've done so far, all of this we talked about, talked about so far, we've spent about thirty five minutes on podcast discussing events that actually occurred over about twenty five minutes. I, th I think that's an interesting way to think about it, Eric. And uh, the other thing that popped into my head, also looking at a timeline thing about that is uh, because he was Catholic, there was a priest there at the hospital. Last rites what? were given before, before the, uh, before the death was pronounced that because of the sequence and the preferred order for yeah. doing that. The, the priest actually stated that he had to remove, had to move the sheet off the president's head 
to give last rites before he gave it. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, powerful thing there. Um, one of the things I'd mentioned, um, and of course Eric's leading the charge here, is that I was thinking about what other rooms we could have associated with this particular date. That was something that runs through my head. And yeah, uh, a, a couple came to mind. I, I'll just throw it out to the, to the I'd, I'd throw out to the team here. Did you guys, I mentioned a couple of them off podcast. Did any of those resonate? Did, did you think of any others? So I mean, the one the that really, one that, oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Alexis. Uh, the one that sticks out to me, just because I've seen the photo, uh, was Air Force One, um, where you have, I must have said Lincoln, not Lincoln, Johnson, uh, Johnson taking the oath of office. And the image that sticks out to me is Jackie Kennedy standing next to him, still dressed in her outfit that she was wearing in the car. So you can see the blood and everything. Um, so I think that that would have been an interesting uh, room to talk about would have been Air Force One and then when Johnson took the office. And, and Alexis, that's exactly where my head went um, on that. And, and, and she, she did this very consciously. You know, she could have mm-hmm. changed, but, but she did this very consciously because she said, I want them to see what they've done. And, well, and, uh, and I'm sorry, Chris, but what's also interesting is when Johnson got on board Air Force One, he issued rules that the plane was not to take off yep. until the president was on board. Mm-hmm. And then, and he said, and he's not going in the cargo hold. And so they literally went and took the seats out so that they could put the president's body in the casket inside air force one. He was very adamant that he, they were not going to load the president into the cargo hold. Right. Exactly. So fasc- fascinating. So let's let's talk a little bit about about presidential succession then. So we mentioned that there is a that that this room there is a we had a, a president who had died. Now we have a, a a president who or we have a vice president who people are referring as president to as president. And then we have some amount of time before President Johnson takes the oath of office. So I don't, and, and I'll be honest, I don't know what that time was. I don't know how much time elapsed between when President Kennedy was pronounced dead and President and Vice President Johnson became President Johnson. We would assume it's it's probably a matter of minutes, but I don't know that for sure. Does anybody know that? I actually uh, did have the timeline here. So if you can vamp for a minute, uh, yeah. Eric, I'll, I'll, I'll get you down to what that is. It's also, as you pointed out, not as long as you think it is. <laughs> It's probably not. I mean, I, we're, we're talking a matter of minutes, but this, but this is also a, this is becoming a very connected world by 1963. And so, whereas a hundred years prior with Lincoln, you, we had a little bit of luxury of time. And if you had a few hours where there was no president, the world would probably keep. But in 1963, it's a very different world. All right, Don, what'd you come up with? Uh, if I'm to believe an article in businessinsider.com, but I have no reason not to believe it, uh, 2.38 p.m. Okay. Is, is the time that they actually associate with the uh, the picture that I think represents what Alexis was talking about, sort of the iconic picture. There was only one photographer, I believe, in the, allowed in the space at the time to do this. So there's a limited number of pictures. It's uh, Johnson taking the oath, by the way, with a microphone there so you can hear the judge issuing the uh so you can hear the judge issuing the oath, uh, Kennedy responding and, and, and um, Jackie Kennedy, I'm sorry, Johnson responding, Jackie Kennedy to his left, his wife, Lady Bird to his right. And, you know, presumably this is, um, this is still 2.38 PM central time. So we, the other, the other thing we have is we're, we'll have a time zone change was to go back to Washington. So we had a, a, approximately an hour and a half where there was, where there was no, no president so that so that that, that is interesting. From, and if you from can if you can matter. see what I just scrolled back to on the timeline, also one of the more interesting things in a, in a different room somewhere else in Dallas at two oh seven, right? There is prime suspect Lee Harvey Oswald already in custody. So Oswald is in custody before Johnson is formally sworn in. Well, and the, you have to say that that Oswald and and we can and we can delve in to this a little bit. I'm, I'm, I'm okay with entertaining a number of different ideas about this. Um, but I, but uh, even if we think we, we, 
even if a person feels that Lee Harvey Oswald was the, was the, the lone gunman here, even if, if, if that is, that is your, your belief, we can say that he acted very suspiciously in events after the assassination. And he ended up at a movie theater and, uh, and, and in, in a, in a way that was, was probably not without suspicion. And then I think uh, he also, he ran away from, a police officer, and I think he shot a different police officer. So he shot J.D. Tippett, right. uh, who was a Dallas police officer. And and I and my my recollection is that's actually probably why he was initially arrested. That is correct. Yeah. They did yeah. not tie him to the Kennedy assassination right away. And and right. what kind of happens in that interim is they try to leave Parkland Hospital, and this is something else that kind of comes about because of the Kennedy assassination. Is they they try to leave. The Secret Service gets the body. They get a casket and they say, we're leaving. And the county judge or the county Dallas County Coroner, Earl Rose, said, you cannot leave the state of Texas until I perform an autopsy and declare him dead. And so there's actually a scuffle between him and some Texas Rangers and the Secret Service at this moment, because there was no federal law on prosecuting a presidential assassin until after the Kennedy assassination. And so that's interesting. Lean, lean into that a little bit, Robert, because yeah. and, and again, I mean, I don't, we don't have any legal yeah. experts. Maybe Don, we need to hire an attorney. Um, but um, <laughs> there, but, but there, this is, this, this is really they, interesting. If, if Lee Harvey Oswald had not been dead, he, he would have been charged with murder in the state of Texas. And the feds would have been scratching and trying to figure out what they could charge him with. Yeah. At that point because there was no law on the books against presidential assassination. The Lincoln people who had been tried, they were all done with um, military tribunal. Oh, interesting. And were hung through a military tribunal there in Washington. Well, and, and when you think about it, most of the, of the crimes that people are prosecuted for are not prosecuted on a federal level. Most of the crimes that people are prosecuted for are all on a state level. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and this is still true today. And again, you know, don't take legal advice from a geneticist, but, um, but it's still, it's, it's, it's important to note that these are, that, that these are mostly state laws. And so they're really interesting jurisdictional problems here. Yeah. That's, and that's and then, really well, in about. reality, the president, get, it gets two death certificates at the end of the day too. He oh, gets one signed by his personal physician arrives in Dallas five minutes later. He uh -huh. signs the death certificate that says gunshot wound to the head. And then Dallas County actually issues one just kind of on the side because of the legal legal pieces of it as well, which all of that just feeds into the whole conspiracy theory. <laughs> yeah. But in there, in there. We have multiple death certificates here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and, it, and it's interesting because if, if anyone wonders, is this relevant today? I was listening. I listened to another podcast called Breaking Points with Crystal and Kyle, and they actually interviewed Oliver Stone about a week ago. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm listening and it's at the end, they do this little interview segment and I'm just kind of going, hold on a second. Seriously. <laughs> just another little link in these, you know, we all get connected to things in various ways. Uh, those of us that are from Texas get connected, you know, because we've been to Dallas or been there, but uh, the 22nd of November happens to be my in-laws wedding anniversary. And so uh, that was discussed here when we passed the anniversary on the 22nd by my mother-in-law that, you know, she, she can easily remember either when she got married and or when Kennedy died or both because she could associate those two things, associate those mm -hmm. two things together. Uh, she was actually traveling that day. So she was uh, very much like the 9-11 experience. Her flight was delayed. I think she was in Austin. And so her flight was delayed that day just because there was a general disruption to air travel related to the assassination, not the same way that the 9-11 had been a disruption, but this was a disruption too. So no, that's there. I, uh, I will not be the one that takes this down, although it is an area of interest for me and long has been the conspiracy th theory. I'm showing, showing the cast now one of my favorite little books, Who Shot JFK, yep. which has... By the way, it lists, it says it has the major conspiracy theories. It's my favorite thing about the book. It says a guide to the major conspiracy theories, right? There, there are no, 38, no, there are no 38 minors. theories. There are 38 major conspiracy theories. So who knows how many quote unquote minor conspiracy theories there are. But uh, it wasn't until I was an adult. I'd been to Dallas a number of times in my life, had family there. But it wasn't until I was an adult, actually went downtown to Daly Plaza, to the sixth floor museum, to the actual location of the assassination. So it, 
why that was not until I was an adult. I don't know. That's one of those strange things, having been to Dallas so many times otherwise. But I firmly believed that I was going to walk out on the street there. And the street very much looks like it did in the day, partly. It know, does. It very made much does. Doing that. And then, you know, films that have been shot there, see Oliver Stone's JFK, for example, Robert Stern. Sure. There. But uh, I, I, I firmly believed I was going to walk out of the Daily Plaza and there was going to be some type of parting of clouds, sunlight from heaven, a voice from heaven. And it was going to say the magical reveal was going to be LBJ New. That's what I thought was going to come out of heaven. Uh, it did not happen. But um, I, I do think I do think it's interesting that. I think if you ask most people, if, if you just said you're going to you're going to have a podcast, you're going to talk about the Kennedy assassination. I think it's logical that we would go to Parkland because of the structure of this podcast being about a room. Right. Right. But, you know, but people don't associate what happened there at that trauma room. It's in Daly Plaza or it's it's, it's the it's the car. It's maybe again from from the, you know, the actual place, which was pretty important. The trauma room is almost an afterthought. Yeah. Well, this gets into a thing that I've just been thinking, and Eric, maybe you can speak to this, and we were kind of talking about this off podcast, but I mean, half of his brain is on his wife's dress, half of his brain is on or in the car. Um, So when he gets to Parkland, yes, they do the chest compressions and things like that, but can you kind of walk us through what those doctors were thinking? Were they thinking like, we can save this man, or were they thinking... No, this is no. a foregone conclusion, and we're just going to say we tried everything you, we could. You, you go through the process. I mean, there's a process you go through because you know, number one, it's it's you know, it's it's the right thing to do, um, you know, and but number two, it's because it's the president. I mean, you know, you right. you know, nobody wants to give up on the president too too early, but it, it's a truth that that you bring up, Alexis, that even if they could have by some miracle gotten the president's heart restarted, what then? You know, right. we, we have we have a president who is who has sustained a, a, a major head trauma. Um, the the defect in his in the in the kind of the, the back part of his head was was described in the autopsy as being 13 centimeters. That's massive. And so this is a president who is who is never going to be able to again, in best case scenario, let's just say that everything else lined up and we could get his heart started and we could put him on a ventilator and any and things like that. You know, under the best best scenario, this is a person that is going to be neurologically devastated, and so there's really there's really no coming back from this from a from a, a presidential debility standpoint. And this is kind of where and so thank you for teeing this up, Alexis, because it's actually kind of a perfect way to de- to describe this because you you know we this is pre twenty fifth amendment, and so we we have a lot of constitutional scholars uh, that that listen to both room where it happened in a fork in time. But it's it's not lost on I think any of us in this room that the Twenty Fifth Amendment was submitted to the, to the states in 1965, and was adopted in 1967. You know, several years subsequent to the to the Kennedy assassination, and it has to do with a number of the different things, including presidential succession, vacancy of the vice president, but also a president's declaration of inability. So, um, so you can you can transfer the presidential authority to the vice president if the president is unable to discharge the powers and duties of the president. And so you could you could if there were a twenty fifth amendment that were that that had been let's just say it had been ratified in nineteen sixty one for you know reasons, and that was and that was something that was present at that time. Then then Johnson could have been could have been granted the powers of of the acting president. Uh, it, it, until such time that Kennedy died, it, it, assuming that he probably would have even under the best of circumstances. So that, the, so to me, that's that's a very interesting constitutional question uh, in terms of presidential succession. I'm going to raise an other interesting political question that, that Please just do. crossed my mind. Yeah, that's uh, invoking the Twenty Fifth Amendment is generally a cabinet decision. Yeah, um, we previously mentioned who the attorney general is right we on our vietnam pa- podcast we may not have even mentioned him by name but we definitely talked about the secretary of defense being a very close and loyal kennedy person we would definitely so, call him close and loyal yes so is there some conflict okay. of interest yes <laughs> well and, and 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 you have to remember too 
Johnson and Kennedy, and especially Bobby, were not best of buds. No. They, they, he despised them probably with every fiber of his being. And I don't know if they felt much better about him. He was a political expediency who ran a very close second to Kennedy in the Democratic nomination process and basically only took the vice president slot because Sam Rayburn came into him and said, I don't want that son of a bitch, pardon the French, Richard Nixon to be president of the United States. So you're going to take the oath of office. <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, it's interesting that but before you raise the, the specter of the 25th Amendment, I hadn't really thought about that much today, Eric, about this and this be where we're going. I'm glad we are in the sense that, by the way, it makes it, it, it makes a, a fork in time episode that I'm willing to do because it doesn't violate our jump the shark rule, which is what would have happened if Kennedy had survived and you had this sort of, you know, questionable state of, you know, is he, it, does he have the faculty to execute the presidency? Yes. Okay. He's breathing, you know, by, by, by artificial or other, or other means, but you know, does he have the faculty to hold the office? That's a whole other interesting. What if that's nothing to do with the assassination itself, but the thing that really strikes me about this is how often this is this is a testament to our American political culture and our Constitution. You know, the founding fathers were brilliant, you know, say what you weigh, will or won't about the Constitution and how well it's endured. But part of what was so brilliant about it was they didn't try to figure everything out. They left some of the they left some ambiguity that that's played well. We played the ambiguity well. But. A lot of what we have, the 22nd Amendment, well, that comes along because this guy decides to break, you know, Washington's precedent and goes for a third term. Whether he's got a good reason to do it in 1940 or not, it's a whole other thing, but he chooses to do it. The 25th Amendment comes along because you've obviously just had this situation where there's been a concern, you know, about what would happen. Uh, actually, the other thing about the 25th Amendment, uh, is that correct? Or is that in the, is it, that's, in the 20, that's in the 25th, right? How do you get another vice president once you've lost one? Because we also that's forget... Yep. Because we also forget how many times this also one of the things I felt like I should have known, given what my degree is in, but sort of didn't or forgot is how many times we went without a vice president. Just because the vice, yeah, but because the vice because the vice president had assumed the presidency and there was no means for d replacing the vice president. Yes, there was succession because the Constitution had said what the what the sequence would be from that point on. So that wasn't an immediate concern yet. But just or, how often are Americans as as our as our resident Marylander, or if for some reason like massive tax evasion, the you vice president going, has to resign in place. Yeah. And so you end and so you end up with a vice president who is nominated and who who and, and who assumes the, the duties of vice president and then who then assumes the 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 duties as president and all of these undertenants of the 25th amendment scarcely 10 years later right. and yep. and that person was was never elected in a national office the only office they were elected to as i recall is a congressman from michigan yes mm -hmm. so so the argument that can be made is no no kennedy assassination no gerald ford as I a mean, president, as a president, probably. I mean, I mean, that's uh, so. So, Don, Don, <laughs> I want to point out that that you we you have just done what you always warn us against. You have made a rumor it happened. You've made it a fork in time. time. Yeah, so, <laughs> and, so, and, and sometimes, in all fairness, we make a fork in time into the room where it happens. So that's we, that's, we do that, yeah. and, we, that, and it's all fair. in good fun. It's yeah. all in good fun. But but but, but I hadn't <laughs> thought about. The two things. First of all, the how the twenty fifth amendment directly flowed. I knew it, but hadn't really thought about it. But then, just again, the other thing for me is how often our constitution has to be because we've had a oh we need to fix this. We hadn't thought about exactly how this would work. Now we need to go and fix it, and so it's an event that causes us to need to fix it. Right, right. You no, know, that that's and, and that's absolutely right. That that we uh, we we tend to be more responsive, but. I think very few of us would would looking back would disagree with with the with the the rationale for creating the twenty fifth amendment. You know, as it turns out, it it you know it helped helped us a lot in, in you know nineteen seventy three nineteen seventy four. I mean, you know that that would have been a very probably a very different scenario if there if that ambiguity would have been there um, with a with the absent vice presidency and a president that resigned. And again, now I'm creating a fork in time, but, you know, but, but now, now you say, you know, getting in, I am getting in into the, the um, very eccentric mind of Richard Nixon 
and saying, I don't have a vice president. Do I really want to resign? Um, or, or, or am I going to, am I going to stick it out and see what happens? Yeah. Well, well huh? change the dynamic. <laughs> I, I, I can help with this. So please remember do. Nixon had been a part of the Eisenhower administration. He was vice president. He sure, he sure did. And Eisenhower actually had to undergo emergency surgery and had a heart attack a couple of times during that time frame, And so was, so the question is, as we think about the 25th amendment, were the seats planted then, and then Kennedy's assassination puts the exclamation mark on the need for a 25th amendment? Um, I think that is, I think that's a very reasonable read on that. You know, we, we, we look at this in terms of natural causes, um, but I think that's a good read. And, well, and, and to be fair, you were also looking as we get into the, you know, the mid and later 60s into the Johnson administration and to his, his own term, he had a lot of health problems himself. Mm -hmm. and, you, know, you know, Lyndon Johnson was by, we'll just say like, we'll say 1967 was not a well man. And he only, he only lived a few additional years beyond that, uh, which probably relates in some ways to his decision not to run in 1968. But, you know, I think that there, there was an eye on Kennedy most prominently, but I absolutely agree, Robert. There certainly was an eye on Eisenhower and probably an eye on Johnson, too. Well, I'd say it's more an eye on the role of the president, especially in foreign policy at this point. Right. That there has been this change. And if we don't know who's in charge for an hour, that opens us up to all of these things, that, these bad things that could be happening, these, these, these opportunities for other people to take advantage of us. And by the way, I, 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 you know, I don't want to go too far down this hole, but in 64, the guy on the other side of the Cold War gets removed. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of ambiguity around how that happens, because in that system, there is absolutely no succession whatsoever mm -hmm. so there there's you know in 64 and into the 80s you have a lot of changeovers where we don't know who's in charge on the other side and that plays into the cuban crisis of when we get the two telegrams one which is very conciliatory one which is very not who's on the other side there so i think that's an interesting point for an argument for the 25th that it, it's a continuity thing you you can look down this list and be able to tell who you need to be talking to in any situation now i'm going to ask this to chris specifically but certainly to the to the rest of you as well is this because the world is simply more connected by 1963 and we are we are in the middle of a cold war or is this because the the power of the executive by 1963 is something much more like we would recognize today or a little bit of both? I do think um, if I were to randomly ask, I'm not going to put our resident political scientists on the spot, but if I were to ask somebody to name who the 19th president was, I know what they're going to do. They're going to count forward from 16 because basically between Lincoln and Maybe McKinley, maybe when you start getting into the 20th century Roosevelt, you have a large period there where the president almost doesn't matter. I mean, you know, we talk about Garfield's assassination where it took, I, I, don't quote me on this, but it was over a month, I believe, where oh, we was, don't have a president. A, nobody really seemed to mind. It was um, a long time. Well, and that's, yes. and, and that, that is a potential room where it happened. Uh, that we could, I mean, and, and I could, yeah. um, I could really dive into all the medical stuff. And let me but, tell you, it gets, it gets icky with Garfield. But, well, but, but I do think, to answer your question, I do think it's a matter of the technology. Yeah. Maybe the rocket technology, which we so delved into during our space race episode, um, that you can have really bad things happen really quickly if you don't have somebody on the other side to make that decision. Mm -hmm. well, and, and Chris, I'm going to kind of jump on your bandwagon. Remember Woodrow Wilson was incapacitated for months with the stroke. And this was right after world war one. And nobody seemed to mind that 
Madam President was running around kind of functioning as the president at that moment. I I I agree with you a little bit in that nobody seemed to mind. I would say nobody really knew. In, in yeah. Garfield's in Garfield's case, as I understand it, there were telegrams coming out. There were regular updates. People knew that the president had been shot, and there yeah. were health updates. It was it was transparent. But you're absolutely right in that the fact is the presidency was vacant. And they were able to keep it so under wraps that people didn't know about it. Took two um, months for Garfield yeah. to die, by the way. Thank you, Wikipedia. <laughs> we can know, so we will know. But, uh, um, well, you know, we're talking here about minutes in the case of Johnson and Kennedy and, you know, the difference months months become minutes you know you take a century goes by and, and that's how things that's how things matter and they're different yeah uh, well right and, and it would be it would be a matter of it, it, an even smaller matter of minutes now it, you know if, if anything ever happened to the to to a president i mean i I'm, I'm thinking about my my own lifetime so i you know i don't remember when 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 uh, president reagan was shot i was only i was only two years old so i don't remember that but when there have been other presidential health crises, you know, I feel like we know about those within minutes, you know, whether they're minor or not, we know about I, I them. Was, we didn't mention FDR, but his ability to keep his physical ailments hidden, and yet he oh. was still a very, yeah. So that, that, that is, that's another, that could be another, I don't know. I don't know if that's a rumor to happen. So I, I think that's a series of something. So there's a, there's a, there's another podcast that I would love to do, which is called Eric talks about presidential health histories. Um, that would be super fun to me and probably, um, you, 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 would you would have an audience of dozens at a minimum, yeah. Eric. Dozens but, but at a minimum. I, I, I can think. Of, I can think of one friend that would probably listen, but um, but I, I but I don't know anybody else who would who would listen to that. But uh, there is one thing I do want to kind of think about. Um, we talked the last time Don and I got together. We talked about the Vietnam conflict, and think about Korea. After World War II, you did not have a war. You did not have a conflict that was declared by the United States Congress. It was always the president as the commander in chief of the military reacting to something that supposedly just happened or reacting in a much quicker way than assembling Congress, putting forward a um, formal declaration, et cetera, et cetera. So I think- right. That also, it, I do believe it's probably been used by the executive to centralize some of that authority, the excuse of it. But there is also something to be said that, you know, in this Cold War situation, you can't get everyone together. Mm -hmm. there, there are at times decisions must be made immediate in, in the world we live in at this moment. So no, Chris, you and Eric, I'm guessing that you were a young child in the early 80s. Don and I are probably the two that remember the most of the actual Cold War and worrying about, <laughs> you know, in 15 minutes, we're all going to die. But somehow getting under that desk was going to save me. I never quite understood. how. Yeah, that was yeah going to work, I, I but, never uh... figured that out either. But <laughs> well, and, and, <laughs> and by the time smart enough to read up on how nuclear weapons actually work and what they did. And I was like, yeah, this is but that wooden desk. It's going to save you. It's going to be yeah, fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> so my, my, my first, you know, political memories were, were when I was, uh, and I was in, I was in kindergarten and this was the, the 1984 presidential election. So we, we were, you know, the, the cold war was still very much on, but you know we we had we had lost a little bit of that existential angst about the about the the idea that we were going to be obliterated right away uh there was a sense that we had we were at least in the on the right track and you know and, and i would say that that um some of my my i don't know the earliest memories but definitely growing up some of the most indelible memories were were those concerning the events of 1989 and 1990 um, I remember being really, uh, and well, and Chris and I are, are pretty similar in age. 
Um, but I remember just being absolutely glued to CNN, watching the Berlin Wall fall down. And remember thinking that, you know, I really want to go see that, that Berlin Wall. I want to go see what's, you know, what's left of it after it goes down. And it, and it took, me, took me another 12 years to get there, but I did. I did as a college student uh, get to the Berlin Wall to see what was left of it. One of the questions that I wanted to raise, you know, again, just also talking generally about the topic here is, and we're all we're all we're all of enough of an age difference that it, it is sort of different. Robert's a few years older than I am. We we're both in high school at the same time, and Robert's what three years older, I guess, than I am. Is um, do you think we have different perceptions of Kennedy based upon? sort of where we where we, where we were in life and how far we were removed from it i'm all of us are born after his assassination so we don't any, have any true overlap there i'm 68 so i'm close but not close he was born in 68 born in 68 born in 68 yeah so and in the assassinations in 63 so you know, I, so, you know I was just thinking do we share a concept of kennedy regardless of party, I'm just talking about by, by age and by generational distinctions there that are somewhat different. Um, so I think the answer to that is, is, is almost certainly yes. Um, so I will say that, that, that I also, I, I, you know, I take a little bit of my, my family from, from this too. Um, so I was born in 79 and, uh, but my, my father was, was born in 49 and you know my my family is is irish catholic and so and and my grandfather it was uh, a died in the wool republican but try tribe before party and so in in that you know 1952 1956 i you know he's gone now so i can't ask him but but i actually feel pretty confident to say he was he was a pretty solid eisenhower guy i know for a fact that not only did he vote for kennedy that he and my father and his brothers and sister went around and canvassed for Kennedy. And, and again, this was, this was, this was in, in, you know, Kansas in 1960, I guarantee you that they, you know, they, they, they canvassed for, for, I, I know for a fact, I don't guarantee, I know for a fact they did this, they canvassed for Kennedy because they wanted to get, it was more important to them to get an Irish Catholic elected as president. Oh, and I'm, so that's, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Chris. Go ahead and finish. Or Eric, go ahead. <laughs> so, and, and well, and, and this is, and so, so I, I freely admit that that I internalized a lot of that Kennedy mythos, and and it's taken me a long time to to really look objectively. And I think Chris and I have mentioned on on campus or on on on, on podcast that if you really look objectively, Kennedy is probably one of the most overrated presidents. He had a lot of really nice ideas, really nice vision, but he didn't have time to execute on any of it. And so even though I, 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 I still absolutely have an affinity for Kennedy and, and I always will, you know, I have to acknowledge that, that the, the reality of that presidency is very different from, from that internalized mythos. Yeah, I, I appreciate you sharing that and getting personal about it there too, Eric, is uh, I think, I think, and that, that became a generational thing for what you just described there, both for you as well as for your, uh, your grandfather in terms of when that was. And you know, I think it's also true um, when I think back on it, I, I, my, my, my father was a labor Democrat, mm -hmm. um, but I grew up um, in a fairly conservative religious home. And so probably thought of myself in my formative years, you know, growing up in the eighties, you know, family ties is on t TV. There's an Alex P Keaton to look at, you know, that kind of thing. It's the ring, you know, probably identified myself more as a, a Republican. I like to think of myself strongly as a, as a, as a true independent moderate now in lots of ways. Uh, uh, but I, I carry both aspects of what's there because of my parentage with my parents, my dad, my dad particularly, and then also my, my timeline. Uh, but there was, you, you mentioned mythos. There was, there was a, there's a mystique around Kennedy that, no that was partly because of, you know, here's this young, attractive, you know, articulate, uh, all the things that go with that, um, the telegenic, you know, we, we talked we talked before about you know the role of the TV was beginning to play in politics and respect, particularly electoral politics. Um, the, the space race, I think most of us here are space geeks to some way, shape, form, or fashion, so we're sucked in by that. Um, there, there's there's a mystique around Kennedy that is only made 
stronger by the assassination, by the events, by the fact that he, he goes into trauma room one on November the 22nd and, you know, doesn't come out alive. You know, argue, arguably didn't go in alive, but certainly doesn't come out alive. Right. And so it, it's left in that, you know, I'm, most of the listeners will know I'm a big baseball fan. There's this thing called potential that, you know, that, that, that athletes can get saddled with, particularly baseball players can get saddled with it. Others can, but baseball players seem to have it as a special, as a special curse or a special gift to have potential. And I, as I get older and think back on it and now know some of the things that have come out, you know, some things that are not as flattering that were not known in the media at the time, but, you know, widely known. Um, Kennedy still had potential because he still, you know, what, what, what would it have been? It could have been great. It could have been a train wreck. It could have been both. Uh, but but it, it was cut short in such a way that it, we're always open to the possibility of what it might have been. There's potential for everything that could have been up and down. Right. And, and one of the things that Chris, you said, and, and I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you after you, after I speak my piece is that, you know, a lot of the things that we think about as being, as being related to Kennedy are really Johnson's accomplishments, you know? It, and so, you know, you know, Johnson really did complete Kennedy's term. And even the first of, of Johnson's own term, you could argue was, it was a lot of those Kennedy initiatives. And then, you know, Johnson sort of came, came into his own, I, you know, I would say, you know, 65 to 68, he really came into his own and that was really sort of the Johnson legacy. So Chris, I don't know if you, if you have any, any additional thoughts to that. I, I'd agree. I, I do find it really interesting um, to give you a little bit of my family's relation to this. We, there's a rumor and we're not sure, but we think my grandmother might've voted for Nixon in 72. If you know anything about the 1972 election, the fact that she might have voted Nixon in 72 tells you everything you need to know about my family's voting records. So he's kind of a hero within that party. And yet I'm part of it is I can't iconoclasm for me. Um, part of it is just like we said, I like legislation. I like things moving forward and I don't see a whole lot of that happening. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Kennedy was not the horse trader that, that Johnson was, and you know, you know, Johnson Johnson was a was an absolute master at that, and and he wasn't afraid to intimidate you in in any way he could. And, and I mean, I, and the, he was a whole lot of, me, of Texas. Part of me wants to say this. Part of me thinks, um, you know, we've talked about a little bit a divide politically between two camps i feel like it might be a little bit of that divide you just talked about between the horse traders and the tv stars yeah tv star politicians can be very intellectually pure because it's image rather than making the sausage very true very true for for me so I was born in 1965, so two years afterward, and very much the same experience that Don's family, my family was a Democrat, FDR Democrat, though. And Kennedy for my family was the great un unfulfilled promise mm -hmm. of the president. And that's how my family viewed it. You know, and 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 strangely enough, neither one of my family members from Texas could stand LBJ Go, going back to Don's great awakening to this day. My father passed in 2001. My mom, if her mind was still all there would probably swear to me that LBJ not only knew, but helped orchestrate. Well, that, 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 that was why I thought the voice was going to come from heaven was because obviously he didn't just know he was part of it. Um, uh, but I, I agree. And it's, yeah, I, I think it, I guess the, the reason I asked that question or brought that up is Kennedy casts a shadow that is unusually long given the duration of his present, yeah. given the length of the term, right? The shadow is so long versus the length of the length of the shadow is so long versus the length of the term. And, you know, part of that is because there's, there's the aspect of martyrdom, which, you know, mm -hmm. plays into that. Uh, but it also, again, that's how you get back to that, potential unfulfilled potential possibility is we don't know 
you know, um, I think he gets reelected in 64, probably, <laughs> you know, but, you know, is that is that even a is that even an absolute given? I, I think so. But I could see scenarios where it wouldn't be. Yeah. Um, I mean, is he is he still running against Goldwater? Right. Exactly. Because, again, once you ch- once the assassination happens, that changes everything. Yeah. So I think if it's if it's still Goldwater nominated in 1964, I think, you know, Kennedy wins in a pretty decisive manner, not the landslide that it actually was with Johnson. Um, but I think he still wins in a pretty decisive manner. But if the but if Republicans nominate somebody different, it could be a little bit of a dogfight. What, what if there's a, a true Dixiecrat challenge in '64 that somehow materializes um, because of something that happens? I mean, again, uh, we're, we're, we're not we're not going to create an AFIT here, but uh, uh, <laughs> well, we've done enough we of that already. A little yeah. bit, we get a little well, bit, <laughs> but 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 if you go to it, and and this is going back to Kennedy's legacy, good and bad. And I, I will postulate that without November 2nd, 22nd, 1963, July 11th, 1969 does not happen. If you talk about the moon landing in July, I think that is, yeah, I think that is, yeah, I think that is, I, I don't know about that. Um, there's no doubt if, that again, if, back you'd to like the, to hear, if you'd like to hear more about the moon landing, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, please, that. <laughs> so, please, so, re, so, please refer to the, so, so many episodes, <laughs> so many episodes to link in the show notes here. I, I should be making I, notes. I'm gonna have to go back I, and listen I, again I, to pick them up. I but, gotta say but, this initially, some of you that are really into the room where it happened will pick up on this. This episode was supposed to be before the November arc. It was. I kind of like it after the November arc. Well, it, 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 it actually, it's certainly. It, it, it's serving the purpose of what it was intended to do in association with the November arc is talking about the event of the assassination, but then talking about all these wonderful what ifs that do flow off of uh, the, the era of the, of the Kennedy administration and the Kennedy administration itself. Robert, Robert, I would disagree with you. I think you still do have the moon landing, um, but I think you have it. It gave an extra boost because this was now part of Kennedy's legacy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the, the one way I think it could have gone different is if his presidency had soured by, by continuing on further, then suddenly the motivation for that could have been lost. So that's how you lose the moon is that the moon benefits because it's Kennedy. The moon possibly could have lost because it's Kennedy. The reason I think not see an excellent hour plus discussion that I would highly recommend is that there was this other participant called the Soviets and didn't matter who was going to be president. We were going to beat those suckers to the moon. Yep. That's right. We, uh, you know, whoever's president, we cannot let the communists win. Yeah. And by the way, this is my, again, to plug what Chris and I actually talked about also, I think on the last, I talked about all the show we have talked about afterwards is if you haven't seen Chris needs to plug his ears. Come to mention a company that should not be ma- mentioned. But if you haven't seen For All Mankind, which is the reimagining of of the uh, of what happens if the Soviets do barely beat the Americans to the moon, is that it that that small of it changes things in you know that that's an outlandish kind of uh, alternative timeline uh, as well. But um, I think the matters, prices uh, of their adapters. There, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Uh, but but I, I do think that, you know, the, the reason I asked the question about how we how the Kennedy presidency gets viewed by those of different ages is I think it always gets viewed to some extent for the better through a positive lens that November 2263 brings. Right. Uh, uh, Alexis, how do you view? I, I'm totally curious. Um, I think it's like a mixture of everything that's kind of been said Kennedy is obviously kind of seen as like this martyred president um I think there's I definitely see an element of okay Bay of Pigs was a disaster um and and Kennedy was not a great president I think there was a lot of promise and I think there was some fumbled the ball a couple times um but yeah I I definitely think that because he's assassinated, he kind of has this up on a pedestal martyr status. And I do think that with the moon thing, I do think that the reason it happens is 
A, it, it was Kennedy and Kennedy was murdered. And so we've got to get this done. We've got, we've got it it's for Kennedy's legacy. We've got to get it done. Also to Eric's point, we got to beat the commies um, to the moon. But yeah, it, I, I, he's this dichotomy in my head because he wasn't a great president. Um, when, you, when you actually dissect his presidency, but he's put on this pedestal and he's, yeah, the shadow is long even so, though there's not a lot of substance to that shadow. So well, does the and, martyrdom remove the failures or, or color the failures, I guess is the better way to put it. It introduces bias, don't you think, Alexis? Yeah, it, it definitely introduces bias. It, it makes him human. It, yeah. you know, it, it's that whole thing of your heroes can still be human and still have flaws. It almost makes him, this is going to sound weird, but it almost makes him a martyr and more human at the same time because it's right. like he's this hero, but he's also flawed. So it's well, like I can I think be that, a hero even though I'm flawed, almost kind of that thing. No, I think you're, I think you're absolutely right, Alexis. I, I totally agree. And, and I also look at this. I look at this through my own lens. So, you know, you, this is this is the podcast where we could sort of in some cases disclose our politics a little bit. And, you know, I consider myself fairly progressive and, um, and, and the, and the, you know, Kennedy is, is in many ways a progressive hero for reasons that are still not clear to me, because if we, if we really look, look at, at where the, a lot of the, the progressive, the progress, the actual progress happened, it was with Johnson and not by a little, by a mile. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of promise and not a lot of delivery. With yeah. I, I, you know, one one story I love thinking about progressive values. Um, there's a movie that came out called The Path to War. It's an yeah. HBO movie. And they've got LBJ after his inauguration talking about Harvard this and Yale that. And was it I, I correct me if I'm wrong. And the guy from South Texas Teachers College rules the roost. If you want yeah. to talk about some, there's something to be said about that LBJ background story as a, a, a great, I you know opportunity it, story. That and that that kind of that kind of thing it, that I that totally resonates with me, Chris, as a as a graduate of the University of Kansas. I, you know, I am not an I am not an Ivy League guy. I'm I'm a state school guy. And um, it, it totally it, resonates it, with me. One of the things that popped into my head as Alexis was talking, the other thing that the assassination does is it, it freezes Kennedy forever young. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, there's an element to that of not seeing your heroes age and have the things that happen when they age. I'm very struck this week. I did have the, the privilege once in my life of shaking the hand of uh, former Senator Robert Dole, who passed away this past week. Um, and, we, and I've, we, and I've had that, I've had that same privilege. And, and again, we, even, even as a person who's more progressive, I, I, I delighted in the, in the, the, the opportunity to meet and to chat with, with uh, Senator Dole, yeah. um, who, who was a, a, a true statesman and gentleman. Yeah. And, 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 and you know, the greatest generation is a whole thing there. And he, he's very representative of that for me in so many ways. But what struck me when the, the coverage was on this week with his death was just how old he looked, you know, and, and he was, he was, I think he was in his nineties. I don't know how far he was. 90, yeah. He was 98. Um, and even when he was younger, he was old, right. You know, when we're looking back at his runs for president, as many as many, many runs for president, but we never see, we never see an old Kennedy. That, that's my we, point. We never see an old Kennedy and yeah. And he's frozen in time. And I, and, and I'm thinking about this. So Kennedy, when he was inaugurated as president was, was 43 years old. And um, if anybody's watching, if anybody's got their watch, I'll, I'll be 43 years old in three months. That's not lost on me. <laughs> and, and the thing that popped into my head there, and I, I need to write that down. So remember, remember when to, when to wish Eric a happy birthday and when to avoid that for recording is, uh, Nixon's not that much older. There's not that uh, much. Of... Four years, 1913, 1917. Am I thinking about yeah, that? Yeah. Right? Uh, Johnson seems forever older, but he's not that no. much older. No, no, he's, he's really not. And, you know, so there's also something about that's the telegenic young Kennedy aspect, you know, the, you know, the president that was made for the burgeoning of TV here, no doubt about that, you know, the intersection of his arrival on the scene and, and what, what is the scene at the time. But 
that also just struck me again, probably struck by Dole's passing this week is just uh, Kennedy never gets old. Johnson got old. Johnson got old quick. The presidency did it. What it did, to most, did, what it did, did does what it does to most president to most people. It ages them. Um, you know, Nixon, Nixon, by the time he's actually president, looks ancient, you know, just a decade later kind of thing. Ken, yeah. Kennedy never has that. Kennedy never has that phenomenon. That's that's what you know, it's a hard way to accomplish it. But that's what happens as a result of November 22 of 63. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I agree. Any uh, any anything, any additional observations from the group? Maybe we don't want to go all the way down this rabbit hole. But I'm going to throw something out there anyway. Um, hearing Alexis talk about the martyred president made me think of another assassinated president who might have gotten out at the right time. Think about what you hear about Lincoln and what he would have done with Reconstruction. And how would his opinion and view in this country be different if he had actually been responsible for reconstruction in any way oh that's 100 percent true <laughs> uh, yeah there, there was i'm there sorry was... but lincoln was kind of saved <laughs> by getting shot in the head there there was no way reconstruction was going to be an easy process and there was no way anybody was going to come out of that politically unscathed right yeah i agree that well, was you... that was blunt the way i put it but no, but you're but you're right, Alexis. It's it's a, it, you're you're absolutely right. It, it it it's it's weird to say that you know leaving a country through a civil war brought made him look really good, but the aftermath it might not have. War Would is not. easy. Peace is hard. Yeah, uh, war and, is and, easy. Peace is hard. And and civil wars are a, are a special kind of. Um, or a special kind of war. Mm-hmm. Uh, they're, 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 they tend to be the fiercest, the most brutal, all the things that go with that. So the peace is going to fall in the same category. You know, it's interesting to me that we've come back several times uh, to Lincoln uh, from from Kennedy, and and I and you know, if you look at the um, if you look at the the ratings of presidents, if you look at kind of the the rankings of presidents in terms of their effectiveness. Lincoln is almost always first or second. And, and I, I would say, I think with good reason, but, uh, and, but Kennedy is also ranked pretty highly. So it's, so it's interesting to me that there's this counterpoint between these, these two presidents who were, were, were elected exactly a hundred years apart. So that's going to lead me to ask a question. I want to ask, I asked about the perception here. Time changes perceptions. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt about that. You know, back to Chris's point. Yes, I would have to count forward from 16 to figure out who the 19th president is. That's just the way it works. Rutherford Hayes. Rutherford B. Rutherford B. Hayes. Rutherford Ooh. B. Hayes. Ooh. Um, uh, to be fair, <laughs> to be fair, Eric has had how much? At least a good 15, 20 minutes of podcast time to be looking that up. Yeah, but no, but, but my, no, I, I, that's true. I could, but I didn't because I memorized all the when the I was president. There you go. No, no, no. When I was in fifth grade, Chris, don't ask me why. I do a lot of things that don't make any sense, but I memorized all the presidents in order. So I, so I've got that. I've got locked down. And, and if I stop and think, particularly going back again, my degrees in political science, so it'd probably be more from a class or something I've read. Uh, Late nineteenth century American politics is not exactly the first place that I would go on any Jeopardy board, for example, in terms of wanting to go there, because the presidents of both parties, although they, they predominantly were of one party, because that was the nature of how things worked. Um, the Republicans and Grover Cleveland. Yeah, yeah. are you know? It, and Grover Cleveland. Yeah, I have to right. stop and think about what distinguishes them from each other, because it's just a series of the you know the same guys. What is what it feels like to me looking back. That was not true if you were living probably in, you know, 1885, you thought about it differently because that was your recent history and you had more familiarity, although with a different media, different way of, of getting your news. Then, you know, some, I guess one of the questions I would ask is we are now, what are we? We're, we are roughly 65 years removed, give or take, using a ballpark number, a little bit, le- uh, a little bit more. Uh, from the Kennedy assassination, um, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, you mentioned that list, Eric, 
Now, we don't know who's going to come between now and then. But if you told the person, let's say 50 years from now, um, you can only select presidents from um, from Biden and back to make your list. So they can't put whatever's happened that's in the future that we don't know about. Is Kennedy in the same place on most of those lists probably 50 years from now? Will history no. judge him more kindly or will, will it be more harsh? I, th- I think for Kennedy, it will be a, it will be mostly deviation to the mean. I don't think that I don't think uh, think Kennedy will be thought of as as one of the worst presidents, but but I don't think he's going to be considered as high as he is now. I think he's going to be probably somewhere in the middle, would be my guess. The one I, I I'd ask, it it depends on who's voting. Yeah, I've seen Kennedy ranked very highly in kind of People's Choice Awards of presidents, but when you get to more historians you see him start slipping because they're kind of sitting there with that checklist of all right what am i giving you credit for what did you accomplish on an empirical Mm -hmm. interestingly chris i not as much as you as i would think they would though because i because i I see kennedy kind of in that 10 to 15 range okay when when he currently sits at 15 i'm i'm kind of I'm curious because I'm curious. I'm trying to find out, and I had not thought about this beforehand. Is how much has he moved over the past several years? Yeah, and I don't. I don't think he's earned fifteen. I'm also thinking, you know, talking a little bit about the generational gap. If you ask people my age that are not history politically inclined to name five presidents, they're going to go Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, maybe Kennedy. Biden. Okay. Like they 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 think in ter- they don't think in terms of policy or you know what they did for the country. They think in terms of what they learned in history class, which is first president, president during the Civil War, current president, and things that had bad things happen to them or something I, significant happened to them. I would th- I would probably agree only you'd see higher numbers for the past 3. Uh-huh. Yeah. They did definitely yeah. And, and, and what starts to happen there, you know, as the list gets longer, what are we up to now? 40, Six, 46? 46. I have to stop 46. and think for a second. 46. Uh, as, as the list gets longer, you know, some are just going to get lost in the shuffle. It's hard to remember, you know, all 46 names unless you're Eric and you memorize them and you did it the right way. I'm not but, in fifth grade uh, anymore. So I'm, yeah. I've, I've stopped. So I, I have to admit, like, the numbers sort of, I, I, I do get a little mixed up after um, after that time, which was uh, which would have been Bush 41 when when this happened when I was in fifth grade. So and, and, and back you, when he was just President Bush, you didn't have to say he was you didn't Bush have 41. to distinguish which you, one he was. Yeah, yeah, you didn't have to say 41 or 43. Yeah, he, you know, Those you, the, days. the first thing that pops into my head, you know, with a uh, with a Grover Cleveland is, you know, the, the split terms. That's, yeah. That is that is the fact that I hold in my head about Grover Cleveland. I'd really have to stop and think for a second. What else do I know about Grover Cleveland other than the fact that he <laughs> served terms that weren't, you know, weren't consecutive? You know, it, as far does as anybody, I can does anybody tell, 50 years, does anybody 50 years from now remember there was this guy named Taft, you know, that was a one term for you know, that, that sort of thing that starts going on after a period of time. I, ironically, ironically, the reason I bring this up point on Taft, we yeah. have reached a point on Taft that if you talk to somebody about Taft, you know what they remember the bathtub. That's they what the bathtub. Today That's remember what I have bathtub. in my head. Well, and yeah. as far as I can tell, the the kind of the 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 19th century presidents, we'll say after Grant, are primarily distinguished by their facial hair. Exactly, and that's really it. You know, <laughs> which it, uh, who's rocking the beard, who's got the glorious mustache. That's yeah. it. And then the next thing you know, there's Roosevelt. Then there's Roosevelt. T R. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, and you, what you know about, and, and what you know about McKinley is there's a mountain name for him. And he, you know, Roosevelt became president because he was his vice president. <laughs> well, there, there was a mountain named after him. Yeah, not anymore. Not That's anymore. True. And so, you know, one of the things that, yeah, the reason I asked that question about 50 years from now and why this is relevant, this sort of brings us, I hope, back full circle. We've named all types of presidents that had longer terms than Kennedy. Any, any one term president who served his entire term had a longer term than Kennedy by just by definition. And True. yet, you know, the, the shadow that comes from that because of the time and I think because of the death, both of those things together cause a bigger, that rock makes more ripples than it normally would for the period of time that it has to make ripples. 
Yeah. And and then then of course the you know the important things that are still relevant today: the space race, the Cuban Missile Crisis. I mean, there's thing you know things that it's not just about getting shot in Dallas. Although getting shot in Dallas is a great way to be remembered as a president, apparently. That will um, immortalize you, but only at great cost. Yeah, and that that just strikes me is that you know for example I think history for example we far kinder to Bush forty one the more that time goes by to a degree that probably it is now. Uh, other presidents that have fared well will will not be as well remembered. I think Reagan's legacy will tarnish even more over time as things go. Uh, you know, Carter's presidency, people are going to recognize the challenges that he faced during the period of time that he was in there, and they're going to look at that slightly different. They may not ever put him on the top 20 of any list no. of presidents by any even stretch more. of the imagination, even but they're more. going to appreciate what the challenges were I, between I, 77 I, and 81. I think the best example of that is Harry Truman, who has aged very well. I was just going to bring up. Yeah, Truman. I think I think in, in, in 100 years, I think Truman will, will be decidedly considered a top 10 president. Yeah. And you know, so to, to, to me, that's the interesting part about, you know, some of the speculation you can have around around a presidency is the way it's viewed in its short term and the way that it's viewed in its long term are not necessarily going to be the same things, but it takes a while. Um, and I guess the other, you know, the other combustible fact, combustible factor of Kennedy is he's thought of very differently in a very short period of time, again, because of the martyrdom, you know, trapped, uh, iconic trapped in time thing, whatever it is you want to call it. Yeah. A quick so, scan. He bounces between eight and 15, depending on what year you're at. And there's no trend one way or the other oh. different groups. Yeah. And I, and Just, I think that is, I think that is overrated. And, and I say this as a person who's a, who's a, a pretty big kind of fan of the, of the, you know, kind of the Kennedy mystique. Um, I, and um, I still, and I think that's pretty, pretty markedly overrated. That, uh, Alexis, you might want to close your ears for this one. We kind of fought a war about not being a monarchy. Uh, oh, I know. We actually <laughs> fought two of them. Yeah. But, 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 but ironically, to some degree, the Kennedys were the closest thing we had to royalty there for a bit. For a bit. Yeah. For a bit. But this is the United States, and eventually it changes. Sure. So, all right. Well, I, this, uh, this feels like a great place to wrap it up. Yeah. And so if any, if anybody would like to, uh, w- would like to, to weigh in anything more. So, so Don, you, you always have a, a, a way of kind of wrapping up the, uh, the rumor it happened that I, that I really like. So, um, I'm going to turn over to you just very briefly to, to, to close it in that way. Well, I'm going to see if I can actually live up to that since this is only episode number five now. And I, I wasn't on number four, which is good. Uh, but we are going to talk about where we go next. Yeah, uh, that's what we're supposed to do here. And and the plan, I actually need to pull it up to make sure I know this because we're actually out of sequence. This was supposed to be room number four, and then we were supposed to go to something else. But the whole concept behind the room where happened is that we would sort of introduce where we're headed to next. And so I'm pulling up the magical episode status spreadsheet here. Thank you, Google Docs and Google things that are there. Uh, we're talking about going to, um, it'll be what happens in January. Mm-hmm. Since we're recording here in December, and I think this is actually one also that Eric, you were you were excited about, and it ties back to some of the stuff we've done here recently. We're going to go to uh, Mission Control, January twenty eighth, nineteen eighty six, and uh, it's the flight of STS fifty one. So we're going to be talking about a little thing called Challenger. Yeah, that'll be a really that'll be a really interesting interesting podcast. I'm I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah. Um, the other thing I just want to mention here about the show and just want to close out with this again, I, I, I enjoy looking at the screen. I, we have the benefit of looking at the screen here. One of these days we're going to actually post this recording so you can see what it's like to get the rest of it. Maybe at some point we'll tell everybody when we're going to do that. I'm in a, uh, I'm in a baseball cap and I'm, I'm not in my most presentable form today. Chris is hiding in the bunker and Robert looks like in a professional place and Alexis looks fine and Eric, Eric, Eric looks great. But, uh, well, again, I, I like seeing the faces that I see on the screen here. I'm just like talking to the faces that I see on the screen. I hope that if you're a listener to the show, um, you like just doing that. I, hopefully you feel like you've just sat in in a room where you're with friends. And if you were here, you know, we'd give you the space to talk to. Too. And the truth of the matter is, we'll give you the space to talk to. <laughs> if you want to come join and be part of this, let us know. Go to the website. Uh, let us know that you're interested. Everybody that's here on the screen, Alexis had inside track genetics and all that, but uh, everybody and Robert, you know, going back with friendship that goes back to high school days, but everybody that's here, 
uh, it's here because they want to be here and you can be here too. So I just want to let our listeners know both for a room, room where it happened as well as a fork in time uh, that the, the mic is open. Come join us. We, we welcome here. We welcome the topics. We welcome the conversation. And uh, like I said, I very much enjoyed, I very much enjoyed listening to room number four and being surprised by what I heard because I wasn't there when it was recorded. That was fun. And uh, so I encourage that as well. Um, we talk a yeah. lot about the other podcasts. We, we now interspace the inter splice the two together, which I guess makes perfect sense. They are similar, but they're different. Uh, the goal of this podcast is to be more about the actual history. I think we did that pretty well. We also are not afraid to touch some of the political touch points here. We really work hard on a fork in time not to make it political because it's so easy to make alternate history very political. There's a lot of political alternate history out there. Uh, but if you aren't familiar with that show because you found this show, go check that show out. Uh, we have 127 episodes now. It's hard for me to believe that I can say that. And you'll see a lot of links in this because I'm going to include the show notes of almost everything we missed. I think you probably referenced or, or mentioned. We probably listed eight or ten episodes that we've done and some of the people that are here. So, Eric, I'm going to ask you what you like that I do that I close out because I'm struggling to figure out exactly what it is no, that, that I do. That was, that was it. That was it, Don. It was the it was kind of the the, the plug there. And and. And, it, and I'll take this opportunity, if I could, to talk about sort of my, my history with the podcast. And, you know, I, I started out as a, as just as, a, you know, I will say just as a listener, I started out as a, as a listener. I, I was, uh, it was the, uh, it was summer of 2020. It was a pandemic. I was getting kind of bored. I decided I was going to, I was going to do a little, little better in the exercise department, you know, like you do. And so I started taking these really long walks, get my Velcro shoes on because I'm an old guy. And and take uh, take these long walks and I and I needed some content. I needed some podcasts to listen to. And I'd always loved alternate history. And so when I searched for alternate history, I came across the a fork in time, and I started listening to it. And and I uh, I you know I enjoyed the, the podcast. And I said you know I said you know gosh Don and Alexis seem like nice people. I'm enjoying listening to them. And so I then eventually I kind of took the plunge and said you know what I'm going to be a patron. And, and then when I, be, uh, when I became a patron, then Don and I started talking a little bit about, about content. And it was about probably about what, maybe a month after that, that, uh, that I, I was a, a guest for the first a Fork in Time podcast. And since then, it's just been a wonderful journey getting to make friends. I've, uh, I've really enjoyed working with Don, Alexis, Robert, and Chris. Chris and I have had a, we've had an absolute blast the last few weeks recording these, these podcasts. And so, you know, if you, if you, if you like talking about history, if you like speculating, if you like riff, riffing about these things, if you like making friends with nice people, we're nice people. And so we, uh, we would encourage you to be a, be a part of this. And so, uh, you know, in, in, in closing, I would just say, this is, uh, you know, th this has really been a lot of fun for me. Um, I hope it's been a lot of fun for you to listen to. And, uh, and I hope you will continue to stick with us and we'll stick with us and tell your friends about a rumor it happened. And I hope you will tell people about a fork in time. And so with that, I will bid you a good night. 